So far, I've done a fair bit with derivatives of vector fields. Curl, divergence, conservative fields as the output of a gradient, which is also a der derivative operator. Now I want to start talking about integrals. By the end of the next video, these integrals will relate back to everything I developed about conservative fields as well, and it all fits together quite nicely. So I'll start again with a vector field f on the set u and r3, representing a fluid flow or a force. Now I'm going to consider a parametric curve gamma, gamma moving through the region. I'm going to think of this as the path of an object moving through the situation caused by the field. If this field is, say, wind, this is an object moving through the wind, perhaps with the wind, perhaps against it, perhaps across it. If the field is force, then the path is an object moving through the force, again, possibly along with the force and possibly against the force. Note that this path doesn't need to be an integral curve, as discussed at the end of the last set of videos. This can be a path which is simply influenced by the force. This could be a path of a leaf in the wind, which with the right initial velocity should be an integral curve following the directions. Or it could be the path of a person struggling to move upwind, acting against the force. In either case, there is an interaction of the field and the path. In the case of the leaf in the wind, the field and the path work together. In the case of the per person moving upwind, the field and the path are opposed. I'd like to measure this interaction. An integral curve was defined to be the curve where the tangent vector and the vector field coincided. For another curve, the tangent vector and the vector field may not coincide, but they both exist and I can look at their interaction. I have a tool for this, the dot product. The dot product measures the similarity of two vectors, being largest when they are in the same direction, negative when they are in opposite directions, and zero when they are perpendicular. So, given a field and a curve, the dot product with the tangent will measure the interaction. This dot product interaction tells me how the field and the direction of the curve interact at a single point. However, I may want a more holistic understanding of what happens along the whole curve. In the process of moving along the curve, how does the field act? Does the field push the object along the curve? That would be a positive influence. Or does the movement along the curve have to do hard work to counteract the field? And that would be a negative influence. Or perhaps, does the curve move perpendicular to the field and there is no influence at all? This question of interaction of a path through a vector field is answered by calculating the integral of a vector field along the curve. A major change for integrals of vector fields is domain. For scalar fields and for single variable functions, the domain of integration was some region in the domain of the function. For vector fields, the domain of integration is now going to be a parametric object in the domain, not the dom whole domain itself. Integration is going to be interaction along this parametric object. So, say I have a field f and a curve. I'll assume the curve is parameterized by arc length. If you recall, this is the standard way to make a definition that doesn't depend on a particular parameterization of the curve. The line integral of the field f along the curve gamma is written integral of gamma over gamma of f dot t ds, where t is the unit tangent. It is also often written integral along gamma of f dot ds. It is defined to be the integral from 0 to l, which is the bounds of the curve, of f of gamma of s, the field evaluated along the curve, dot with t of s, the unit tangent to the curve. The term line integral is actually a little annoying since the curve does not actually need to be a straight line. The name comes from historical usage where line and curve could be used interchangeably for things like parametric curves. In any case, the line integral is a measure of work or resistance of the field along the path. If the integral is positive, then on average, the field is working along with the curve. If the integral is negative, then on average, the curve is moving against the field. 
The integral curves of the field are curves where the tangents of the curve and the field coincide, and these are the curves that have the largest possible line integrals. Like all good definitions, the definition I just stated using parameterization by arc length is the best definition for proofs and theory, but not good for calculation because parameterization by arc length is often very difficult to produce. I'd like to calculate in any parameterization. How do I do that? Well, let gamma be a curve in R3 that lives in the domain of a vector field f. I essentially want to do a substitution in the previous integral. The arc length s can be written as a function of the other parameter t. This is the arc length function, the distance the curve travels over time t in the parameterization t. Then I need the pieces of the substitution. The ds changes by the derivative of s of t. Here I need the length to make this a single variable substitution, so ds gets replaced by the length of the derivative of gamma times dt. Then the unit tangent is t divided by its length. Here is the definition of the line integral. I replace gamma of s with gamma of t in the new parameterization. I replace the unit tangent and the ds term, and very happily, the length of the tangent disappears, and I get the integral from a to b, the bounds of t in that parameterization, of the field evaluated along the curve dot the tangent to the curve. This is how I will actually calculate the line integral. But this is very convenient since the proof here means that any parameterization that covers the same distance will give the same line integral. The line integral is only a product of the curve, not the parameterization of the curve. It only depends on path, not the speed of movement along the path. It is independent of parameterization. The reason this is so good it, is that it means I can choose whichever parameterization I want to work with, typically choosing parameterizations that are as easy to work with as possible. Now let me do some examples. Here's one in R2. The field is f of x, y equals negative y, x. I drew this field before. It looked like rotation, and its integral curves were counterclockwise circles. The curve I want is also a circle, gamma of t equals r cos t r sine t for t from 0 to 2 pi. To calculate the line integral, I need these pieces. First, the tangent to the curve, the t derivative of each component of the curve. Then the field evaluated along the curve. I take the field and replace any x by the first component of the curve and any y by the second component of the curve. Then I take the dot product of these two vectors, which is r squared sine squared t plus r squared cos squared t, which is just r squared because sine squared plus cos squared is 1. Then the line integral is the integral of this dot product in the variable t over the domain of the curve, in this case 0 to 2 pi. Well, this is just a constant, so the integral is 2 pi r squared. Do note that all these line integrals turn into single variable integrals in t. We're not even doing multiple integration here. This is a positive number, and it is larger with the radius. This reflects that the path gamma lines up with the counterclockwise circular direction of the field. A path that goes long with the vectors of the field has a positive line integral. And the larger the radius, the longer the path, and the more substantial the effect. An important example that I've already mentioned a few times is the force due to gravity. Here is that force per unit mass, for capital M a mass centered at the origin, and G the gravitational constant, of course. Let me consider a path gamma of t equals t t t. This is a path going directly away from the origin, starting at some a a a and ending at some b b b, for some positive numbers a and b. The derivative of gamma is 1 1 1. The evaluation of f along gamma replaces x, y, and z, all with t, since each component of the curve is just t. The denominator has t squared plus t squared plus t squared, which is 3t squared, inside the square root and cubed. Each negative x, negative y, negative z, or negative t. Well, then I can pull the t squared out of the root and just get t cubed in the denominator. And finally, I can take the dot product. 1, 1, 1 dot negative t, negative t, negative t is negative 3t. Well, then the 3 and the t cancel, resulting in the dot 
dot product of negative gm over t squared times root 3. The line integral is the integral of this dot product in t over the domain, which is a to b. Negative gm over root 3 is a constant, so I'll pull that out of the integral. I do the power rule integral and evaluate on the bounds. Going to common denominator, I get gm a minus b over a b root 3. This is negative, since b is larger than a, representing the difficult work that the path has to do to go away from the gravitational source. I can go a bit further here. Let me assume this is being measured on the surface of the Earth. In this case, a and b are both large, roughly the distance to the center of the Earth, thousands of kilometers. But a minus b is comparatively small, maybe a few meters, say, for throwing some object up in the air. In this case, when the difference a minus b is so much smaller than a or b, then in the fraction, the difference a minus b has a much more substantial effect. For an approximation, I can assume that the a and b in the denominator are constant. So let me call this whole expression lowercase g, which I am treating as a constant. Then the result of the line integral is lowercase g times a minus b. And if I pull out a negative, this is negative g b minus a, and b minus a is precisely the height gained, so this is negative g h, for h the height gained by the movement. Finally, I did this all as force per unit mass. If I put in the mass m, I get negative m g h, and hopefully this is familiar. This is the high school physics equation for the change in potential energy, up to a sign of course, kinetic energy is lost, potential energy is gained. If you want, you can check that this little g has units of distance over time squared, which is units of acceleration. This g is the acceleration due to gravity at the surface of the Earth. This line integral captures, in an approximate form, this potential energy dynamic of objects gaining potential energy and losing speed, assuming there are no other forces, as they gain height. All of this is very archetypical and important to understanding force, potential, conservative vector fields, and line integrals, and I'll continue that theme of trying to connect those four things together in the next video.